So you got these principles of standardization and independent check. When I'm sending a message to you, I encode some meaning of that. And it passes through some pretty noisy environments often. And you as the receiver try to decode what I'm saying. We would give a nurse an order in the ICU to say, okay, they can leave when their vital signs are stable. Now, how do you decode that? Well, who knows? Or hold the tube feeds if the patient's not tolerating them. I, I did this little experiment once where that was an order on rounds and there were about eight people around, and I asked everyone to take out a piece of paper and define how you, or write down how you define not tolerating tube feeds. And as you'd predict, there's eight different answers. And it's not that any one is necessarily right or wrong, though in, in some cases there is, but you're going to have a translation error. You're going to have a, a, a defect, because if I have something in my head that I think it's 150 cc's, and it's not, I haven't communicated that to the, the nurse or the staff who's going to do that, they may interpret it the wrong way with no malintention, but we'll, we'll miscommunicate. There's some fascinating data about the disconnect between teamwork amongst physicians and, and nurses. And this is, this is just ICU data. It happens to be in every healthcare area. Doctors and nurses who work together, when you ask them how good of teamwork is, doctors uniformly say it's great. Nurses say it stinks. We don't know for sure, but I think what it is is that in some sorts, we as physicians may need to recalibrate our view of teamwork. I graduated medical school here believing good teamwork is I give an order and a nurse takes it. And if that happens, we're a team. I, I then thought in my training, boy, I'm really good teamwork. At the end of rounds, I'll ask the nurse if they have any comments, kind of as a pat suggestion. Right? My view of teamwork now is radically different, where we're discussing and making plans along. The nurse is giving input of what he or she sees going on. It's a very, very different model. There's a number of teamwork tools uh, that you can do. I think by far the most important one for you is to make sure the nurses are in rounds with you. It's, it's absurd that you make plans and the people who are going to carry out that plans aren't there to do it, so you will predictably have a translation error. The second key area for you to think about communication errors is in your handoffs, and they are exceedingly vulnerable. And you've all probably done handoffs as medical school and, or your residency. If you're fellow scribbling notes on a piece of paper, it's, it's absurd the way we do handoffs. And, and each of you in your departments will have different core data elements of what you need, but fundamentally, in any industry, and perhaps the 9-11 Commission Report told us this be best, there's, there's three key items for any handoff. And the first is, what do I need to know? So what is this patient? And that may just be a 30,000 foot for a handoff, you know, post-op day five from a gallbladder. What do I need to do? So what's the task list? And then importantly, and perhaps most importantly, what are you worried about? So what's your gut that this patient just doesn't look right, or their urine output's been down, or the kid's breathing fast. Uh, get those three critical components, however you structure your handoffs, uh, to make sure you don't have uh, those kind of errors. Okay, the last concept that I want you to get, so you, you have lenses to see systems. You have some basic principles of standardization and independent checks to make them safe. You know you have to put those principles to how you communicate. And the last is, understanding that teams make wise decisions with diverse and independent input. So let me give you an example. I can't tell you the number of times I've been on rounds where the nurse knew a piece of information but didn't speak up because there was no forum or they were afraid to ask. Or importantly, we had a patient in the ICU the other day that had normal coags, was bleeding. We thought it was surgical bleeding. We we're making plans to go back. The medical students kind of tapped me on the shoulder, you know, and I really busy, said, hey, you know, I got to go put a line in, we're resuscitating this patient. He backed off, kind of got a little more encouragement, and said, hey, Peter, you know, this guy's platelets dropped to 20 on the last lab value, right? Would have completely missed that really critical piece of information that changed management had we not speaking up, spoken up. And so make sure that you get as many lenses as possible. That doesn't take away any authority being a decision maker, right? I, as the attending in the ICU or when I'm attending in the OR, fundamentally you have to make a decision. But I'm much more likely to make a wiser decision. The second point of key decision making, and we probably spend 40 million a year 
in lawsuits from not having this happening is this ability to go between divergent and convergent thinking. Divergent thinking is what happens typically, I won't pick on medicine, but mostly in medical rounds, right? It's brainstorming. You throw out all these great ideas, you know, maybe it could be this, maybe it could be that. And it's a really important point of, of understanding what's going on. Convergent thinking is then taking that and say, okay, this is what our plan is. We're going to do specifically this, this, and this today. And what we've seen is that in any field, that ability to alternate between convergent and divergent is the key to wise decision making. So I make a plan that in the case of that little girl attending saw her in the morning, she looks fine, everything looks great, and she does, but she got sicker in the day. The nurses said, oh, she's sicker, she's sicker, she's sicker. But many of the team said, but we saw her, she's fine, we're on this convergent, and there wasn't that ability to take back and saying, okay, I got a new piece of data in my head, and I need to then say, does my plan still really apply now because something looks like it changed? And that is so hard to do because you're really, really busy. And you're going to be busy, but trying to keep that in mind, the idea of being on the dance floor and getting up to the balcony to see what's going on, getting to the dance floor, getting up to the balcony. The, the kind of metaphor for this idea of the wisdom of crowds that I, I will leave you with is this idea of don't play man down. I, Hopkins is a big lacrosse school. If you haven't been indoctrinated into lacrosse, uh, you likely will be. But at the national championship last year, Hopkins was playing Duke. We were up by four goals with two minutes left. Hopkins got a penalty. In lacrosse, when you get a penalty, you play man down, which means you go into a penalty box and you're short one player. It's a, silly way to play, you're disadvantaged. And Duke, within 30 seconds, scored three goals. Luckily, Hopkins stayed on to, to win, but that penalty almost cost him the game. And I think about what we do in healthcare, and we volitionally play man down every day. Volitionally, because we don't ask the patients, hey, what do you think's going on, or impedes the parents, or your other staff members, and the stakes are too darn high. Uh, far higher than a national lacrosse championship. Well, as you get to the wards, I think you can start to try to develop lenses to see systems. And just think about one process you do, one procedure, one diagnosis, and walk along and see how might I do this better? Where are the risks of this going wrong, and how could you build them into your training programs? I think whenever you could apply these principles of standardization, checklists, and learning from mistakes, you should infuse them into your training programs, infuse them into your work rounds. Uh, the culture here strongly welcomes tr trainee input into this, into this work, and frankly, it's essential because you're the eyes and ears closest to, to, the, to the patient, and importantly work uh, to share what you've uh, learned. Some really concrete things for your role, that whenever you enter and leave a room, make sure you wash your hands. It's, no doubt we kill many, many people in this country a year from our failure to do that. So that's a really key thing. As I said, encourage the nurses to round with you. We, we just put on one of the surgical floors having the nurses round and agree on what explicitly is it going to take for this patient to leave. And, and our measure of success was how many pages the residents get a day. It's an important measure. We, we have other measures, but if it didn't make work less, it wouldn't work. We went from 65 pages a day to the resident service to two. Right? Why? Because we communicated early on, clearly developed a plan, and uh, uh, dramatically reduced everyone's workload. And then importantly, don't play man down. You'll make better decisions, and you'll have an awful lot more joy in your work. As I said, uh, the, 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 the stakes are, are quite high. The, the, the mother of this little girl, it's actually a remarkable story, has worked with the hospital uh, to help improve safety. And on the four-year anniversary of her dying, she came to the hospital and looked me, looked us in the eye and said, could you tell me that she's less likely to die now than she was four years ago? You know, and the sad reality is, I couldn't. I told her all the stuff we were doing, but we didn't really have a good way to measure safety. That We've changed a lot now. I believe we could do that. And importantly, I hope if she or one of your other patients asks what you're doing to make care safe to reduce harm, uh, you can look them in the eye and give them a clear answer. So welcome to Hopkins, and thank you.